Pyramal Pharma was born from the demerger of a larger listed entity, Pyramal Enterprises, and was separately listed in October of 2022. After its listing, it did see quite a volatile phase, which was really a reflection of the earnings, such as the challenges in terms of margins, as well as the balance sheet. But in the past year odd, we've seen the stock rally around 120% from its 52-week low. This has been a reflection of its improved earnings, as well as its debt figures and a successful rights issue. So what does business look like going forward? I have with me Nandini Piramal of Piramal Pharma today. Nandini Piramal, thank you very much for taking the time out and talking to CNBC TV 18. I wanted to start by asking you about your journey since listing. It's been a volatile listing or there was a phase of volatility post listing. Things have settled down, the stock prices actually turned around quite a bit. Uh, can you just reflect back of the, onto the journey of the past year and a half? So obviously we knew when we were listing that we were not part of the index funds anymore. And the index funds had to exit the moment we listed. And so that led to a phase of volatility as you know, index funds were listing, um, domestic funds were, didn't know us. And so we had to educate the market. So I think we've spent the last year actually doing a turnaround both in the bus underlying business. We did a rights issue, which actually reduced debt. And uh, we then focused on educating investors and kind of saying this is our business because we're a little bit of a different business to, pharmace uh, to most pharmaceutical companies. Because if you think about it, our major business is contract manufacturing where we make drugs for other people. Uh, hospital generics, which is a little different again than branded, uh, branded generics. And then we have a over-the-counter drugs portfolio. So it's a little bit different to others. And so we had to actually educate people and say, look, this is how we work. This is kind of how the business is. We've got 17 manufacturing sites that are spread across the UK, um, the US, uh, Canada, as well as India. So it's a, we're just a little bit of a difference. Okay, well, I'm going to get to, you know, discussing the verticals in just a bit, but you raised uh, around 1,050 crores via rights issue successfully. Um, how much of that was used to uh, pair off debt? The majority of it was used to pair off debt. We actually reduced our debt uh, to equity uh, to about 3.1 in the last quarter. And uh, the plan is that we want to keep it, you know, between below three for this end of this financial year. And then beyond that, we'll see. So what is the gross debt on books right now? Uh, it's about 4,000 crores. Okay, so what would be an ideal figure? I think we'd like to, as I said, right now the aim is to get to below three. Mm -hmm. And next year we'll talk more about it. Okay, all right. Uh, in terms of the debt reduction, do you think that having this kind of debt on your books is probably going to constrain you in terms of growth? Um, I think we've done a fair amount of debt reduction. I think we're reasonably comfortable with keeping it uh, below three. And I think as we think the business improves, uh, you know, you'll see organic growth and organic growth and revenue and EBITDA will mean that the ratios are actually quite comfortable. And below three would be a target by when? We're aiming to be between uh, the end of this financial year. All right, now let's get to the business and the verticals. You know, the CDMO business is majority of a business, over 50% in terms of sales. And yes, it is a difficult model to understand because you do cater to multiple, uh, you know, multiple models of uh, the pharmaceutical space. Just tell us how exactly is business doing within that space currently? So I think business is doing very well. We've recovered uh, from uh, actually a very tough year. Mm. And we've seen very good order inflows, especially in our commercial on patent book. So as a business, we were moving from a transition from doing generic APIs and generic formulations to doing more on patent uh, work. And the other biz transition that we were making, we were doing a lot more integrated uh, project. So what we define as integrated is that pe um, the, it'll cover more than two sites. So for example, it could be that you would make something in India and then finish it in the UK or the US. Mm -hmm. So for example, we announced that we got our first ADC to fill finish project, which includes a MAB. So we'll make the MAB at our associate company, Yapan Bio. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, three, six months later, once the MAB is made, it'll go to Grange Mouth, mm -hmm. where, you know, we'll do the EDC and the conjugation. Mm -hmm. And then post that, it'll go to our Lexington facility. So that's in a way a very ideal integrated project. 
but it could also mean that you know we make the API at a plant in Digwal and we make the formulation at a formulations plant in Pithampur. Okay. So there are different m modalities of that. Well, the CDMO business, um, like you mentioned, it has seen challenges and one of the bigger challenges has been the biotech funding, uh, which has seen a slowdown in the US. How has business been impacted? So if you think about it, in the last three years, there have been the lowest funding of biotechs. There's been um, a challenge because as interest rates have risen, people have decided that they would rather invest in other things rather than the biotechs, by which by definition are risky. I think last year saw the lowest number of IPOs in the US for biotechs, as well as probably the highest number of bankruptcies. Now that has affected our development order book. That's the things that start out in phase one and phase two, and you actually do the work in that. But um, the benefit that we've had is that some of the work that we've done with uh, biotechs previously that are at past the proof of concept stage and are about to go to commercial, that commercial on patent book has actually proven to give us good orders. So it's a, it is a mixed bag. Okay, so your CDMO business grew around uh, 12 to 13 percent in the previous quarter. What are you probably targeting? So I think for the second half, I think we're seeing mid-teens growth and a significant improvement in EBITDA. Okay, and when it comes to order inflow, will it probably be better in FI25 versus FI24, or do you see these challenges continue? Um, I think in FI25, I think the We'll, I think it will depend on what happens to interest rates in the past, uh, in the future, uh, as well as what happens in the wider biotech uh, funding framework. And what is your sense on the wider so biotech funding? If we, the most optimistic people say September, other people say January, so I think we're going to plan and see how we can, how it happens. Okay. All right. The other segment is obviously your inhalation products. I think you're one of the third or the fourth largest uh, player globally. How's that piece doing considering that there's lesser amount of price pressure and competition? So the business has been doing quite well. We have significant market share in the US uh, as well as the UK, where, um, which is, and Italy, which is where we have direct distribution. There is headroom to grow in the rest of the world. And until last year, I would say we were capacity constrained. Mm -hmm. um, we had a plant in Bethlehem that, uh, you know, we had to do a lot of debottlenecking and, you know, some modest capex improvements to improve the capacity. And so we did that last year. And so now the benefit is we're no longer supply constrained. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're looking to therefore increase shares in past, uh, parts of the world where we don't have significant market share. Hmm. So, so I think I'm actually quite confident about the business. It is a generics business, so there'll always be price pressure. But you know, because we are vertically integrated, we I think control a, a lot of the supply chain. What is the pipeline? Um... So we are adding generic injectables to that because you've built a distribution structure to serve the inhalation anesthetic. So we actually just. Um, launched a, a you know, bunch of generic injectables. One of them is a zinc sulfate mm. gene uh, generic uh, injectable. So we're adding those into the hospital pipeline. Okay, so when you mean generic injectables, are you focused on regulated markets such as the US? Uh, we would be focused on regulated markets such as the US and Europe uh, as well. So those what, would be the biggest. What is the pipeline looking like? Uh, How much I, can we expect in terms of launches? I think we have over about 25 uh, generic injectables currently in the pipeline at various stages of development, and I think we'll continue to add some more. Okay. All right. The other piece is obviously your OTC segment back home. Um, you have a couple of power brands, and I think that's around 40% of your sales. You're touching around 1,000 crores in terms of revenue within that segment. Um, how is that segment performing? Is it largely being only driven by your power brands? I think power brands is where we're spending the investment in media and advertising and focus of the sales force, as well as we're adding new products to those power brands, right? So for example, our Littles baby brand, we started out with wipes and we added diapers, we added you know, feeding, we added grooming, kind of you continuing to add uh, ranges to that. Uh, so I would say that, yes, the power brands are where the most growth is because that's where the focus and the investment is. And we, want, we believe there's a lot of headroom to grow. There's uh, 
you know, the baby segment alone in India is we're a young country that people are still, you know, getting married and having babies. And people want to do the best for their babies. So I think that's, a, again, I think as a consumer products company, I think this is a segment that I'm very excited about, the Indian consumer. I think they believe in looking at new brands. And they are price sensitive. So you actually have to add, give consumers a value proposition of both price and quality. But the margins, the margins of this particular segment, I think, are in mid-single digits. Uh, when are you probably in increasing margins? So I think now we are reaching a certain scale. I think the focus will switch to uh, you know, paying attention to profitability as well. So whatever profit, profit we were making, mm -hmm. we were reinvesting into advertising, mm -hmm. right? And as you get scaled, you don't need to actually put the same percentage margin back into advertising as you do uh, you know, with a smaller. Because mm -hmm. an ad campaign will cost the same no matter you know, what the size of the brand is. So that's, that's a benefit. Of, that's one of the scale benefits. I think over the next few years, we will you know, kind of make a transition to what we're seeing in the next three to five years, early-ish double digits profitable. Okay. And then as you get bigger, then that can also increase. But. Okay. Uh, but, you know, this segment is also considered to be a possible lucrative segment to consider divestment in. Is that something which the company has considered, considering the kind of uh, multiples a lot of the deals are getting within the Indian domestic space? So, I think space? we still believe that we're one of the few pharma companies that has such a large uh, OTC hmm. Uh, segment it gives us you know a very good handle on the Indian consumer so at this point I think we'd like to grow it more okay so divestment of one or any of the brands is off the cards but would you look to probably acquire we would but again the valuations as you mentioned have been uh, very high <laughs> and so somehow I think again as a public company you know investors will say that look you know what is the bottom line what is profitability uh, you may not be asking the D2C uh, players or the new consumer internet players, you know, any of those questions because they're not. So I think as, as a public company, you're valued on, you know, PBT, PAT, that's what people look at. And profitability, and profitability right? And margins. Yeah. So when you buy, so again, when you look at those acquisitions, you're like, but how, when are you going to make profit? And sometimes there may not be an answer. And there's no, it's so. Maybe you know we're focused on cash and preservation, and at this not point not cash point. preservation, but like free cash flow. Okay, all right. So that's the larger picture that you're probably holding off in terms of acquisitions at this point in time. You're probably going to be focusing on the balance sheet so as right well now, as the PNL. Our focus is organic revenue growth, improving profitability through fixed cost leverage, mm -hmm. um, you know, reduction in cost and operational excellence. That's the that's the focus for the next year.